Our next session on, on Thursday, October 22nd, we'll have Dr. Laura Mitchell of our Urban Education Department, along with two of our alumni, describe their experiences teaching in Houston area classrooms during COVID-19. And that session is titled Social and Emotional Learning in the Era of COVID-19. They're gonna describe the various models of teaching they use in order to create safe learning environments, not only for their students, but to keep themselves healthy and safe as well. And then on Thursday, October 29th, we're gonna host author, social psychologist, Dr. Carol Tavares. She'll join us to discuss the newly revised version of her book, Mistakes Were Made, But Not By Me. We will look into the terms implicit bias and cognitive dissonance. A lot of, a lot of uh, though, both those terms we hear a lot about today. We're gonna to discuss what those concepts have to do with life in America today. Dr. Tavares will speak about how to understand these concepts in ourselves and recognize them in others. So a conversation will include real life examples of these concepts as we see them in public life. And then on Tuesday, November 10th, Dr. Kevin Buckler of our criminal justice department will discuss his research findings from a study, his study on disparities in criminal justice outcomes. He'll discuss the processes that produce sentencing outcomes in illegal reentry cases in federal district court here in Houston. Emphasis will be on how judicial sentencing outcomes are influenced by both individual judicial preference and interactions with other courtroom participants, prosecutors, defense counsel, and probation officers. Then we'll close out the fall um, season with Dr. Thomas Guski, who's the professor emeritus in the College of Education at the University of Kentucky and the author of 25 award-winning books. He's an international expert on K through 16 grading. And he's gonna be speaking on the subjects of grading students learning from home and in hybrid formats. As you know, when schools closed last spring due to the pandemic, educators at all levels had to alter their grading policies and practices to accommodate changes in the various learning formats. And so these practices must be equitable, meaningful, and fair for all students. So Dr. Guski will challenge us with his insights and offer a time of Q&A with participants. So that's our fall season. So now a little a word about uh, this afternoon's program. As we all know, we're in the midst of great social change in our country. And there are passionate people on each side of, of the major issues we as a country are facing. But as this today is not a political discussion, Vital Voices does not want to participate in, in any type of vitriolic exchange of dialogue. We're simply wish to share ideas and experiences of those in, engaged in implementing positive change in our society. So let me introduce this event. In December of 2017, the Harris County Sheriff's Office implemented a telepsychiatry pilot program with patrol deputies. And the intent was to offer assistance to people before they may become involved in the criminal justice system. That program evolved into a pilot telehealth program called the Clinician and Officer Remote Evaluation Program, CORE. CORE successfully demonstrates how law enforcement can partner with other agencies while not removing them from potentially dangerous situations. So before we start, I wanna make you aware that you can feel free to use the chat function to ask questions, and we will attempt to answer those questions throughout the discussion as they fit into the dialogue, or we may, you know, we may wait till the end to answer your questions, but please feel free to ask any question you may have. This session is being recorded and it will be made available probably at the end of tomorrow or probably better, better yet, probably Monday to be fair. It'll be, and it will be on our Facebook page and that's the College of Public Services Facebook page. We have our own page with a lot of the work that we do. So it'll be available there. And I can probably also send you a link to it as well if you're interested. So all you would have to do is email me and you'll see my email address at, on the end slide. So I, um, we have uh, panelists here. We have a, a great panel uh, of people who are deeply involved in the implementation and evaluation of this program, as well as the funder. So we have people here from the Harris County Sheriff's Office, the Harris Center for Mental Health and IDD, Arnold Ventures, and of course, UHD's College of Public Service. 
So with that, I am gonna pass it along to Frank Webb of the Harris County Sheriff's Office and Wayne Young of the Harris Center. Gentlemen. Uh, thank you, Director Volano. Appreciate the opportunity to speak about our program. Um, I would like to start by saying that uh, the idea for this program was that of Dr. Avram Fishkin. Uh, Dr. Fishkin was the first medical director of the Neuropsychiatric Center. That's a facility run by the Harris Center for Mental Health and IDD. It's our uh, psychiatric crisis center. And uh, Dr. Fishkin, uh, subsequent to working as the medical director there, started a company called JSA Telehealth. And uh, back uh, prior to December 2017, he approached me. Uh, we got to know each other very well when he was the medical director. It really goes back to the collaboration that we have with the Harris Center. Uh, we're very fortunate. Uh, I believe we have a lot of successful programs here in Harris County. And I, I think the key is the, the strong collaboration that we enjoy with the Harris Center that dates back to 1991. But getting back to Dr. Fishkin, he came to me. Again, he had JSA Telehealth, which is a telepsychiatry company. He asked if the Harris County Sheriff's Office would be interested in, in, in piloting the program. Uh, Although te uh, telepsychiatry had been used in a lot of different venues, we were not aware of it being used with patrol officers out in the field. So we piloted a program, as you mentioned, in December 2017. It was a three-week program, very successful, and it evolved into the program we have today. So again, the program that we have today, our collaborator now is the Harris Center. Um, and again, it's, it's, uh, I, I truly do believe this is the way of the future uh, as far as to, you know, to have timely, affordable access to behavioral health professionals on a large scale, in my opinion, it's only uh, possible through technology. Uh, you know, there are a lot of programs out there. Uh, there's a co-responder model that, that partners a police officer or deputy with a mental health clinician. They're great programs, however, you know, to do it on a very large scale, it's very expensive. You know, there's a lack of uh, mental health professionals. So again, to try to get on a large scale uh, access to mental health professionals, I think the technology is the way to go. And so anyway, we're very fortunate. We want to thank, you know, Dr. Fishkin for the idea. And we're very fortunate to have a great uh, local mental health authority, the Harris Center, to collaborate with us. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to, to Wayne Young and if he wants to talk a little bit more about that collaboration. Thank you, Frank, I appreciate that. And I appreciate the opportunity to be here today and, and share a little bit about um, kind of the, the early points of the development of this collaboration and project and, and look forward to hearing um, some of the insights that are gonna be shared about kind of where we're at now and, and, and the implementation of it. It, it, it is a, um, strong partnership. It is a, I think, a kind of a, a an innovative approach to figuring out how to leverage behavioral health expertise and, and try and minimize the criminal justice footprint in the lives of people with mental illness. I will also say and echo what Frank did is that it, it's important to recognize we didn't start off with this as a singular idea and point of contact between our agencies. We, we do have a long history of working um, with law enforcement in general, in particular with HPD and, and Harris County Sheriff's Office. And so it was really a building on relationships that have been evolving over 20 years. I, it might be hard to start with this concept as a brand new first opportunity to interact, but because we had that history and experience, we were able to, to leverage the trust and goodwill, frankly, um, between agencies and, and staff members who trusted each other and, and believe that they can, can rely upon each other to do what their, their obligations and commitments are into the program. And really, it, I will say it started off for us um, with, with several kind of key goals that, that you can imagine are, are pretty consistent, um, driven by some circumstances that are pretty common in, in urban communities. Um, the volume of 911 calls related to mental health um, is um, increasing dramatically um, in almost every major um, urban center. The, um, we have a, a significant lack of mental health clinicians, as Mr. Webb said. Um, there is an increasing um, reliance upon law enforcement to interact with people in mental health crises. Um, for better or for worse, that's where we find ourselves set today. Um, we also recognize that um, while we have particular challenges in urban, our urban center, there are rural communities where 
you know, there's 185 counties of our 254 in Texas where there's not a single general psychiatrist um, in practice. And so um, there is large swaths of our state where access to mental health expertise um, is just non-existent completely. Um, while our, our challenges might be a little different here in, in Houston, um, they are no less challenging in other areas. The population growth is another issue that kind of led to this um, and the increasing awareness of, of the impact the current suicide rates um, we're experiencing in our country. Um, nearly 50,000 people a year are dying from suicide in our country. And so figuring out how we can help leverage behavioral health expertise in the streets immediately, I think is critical and, and important for our community um, and to support our friends in law enforcement. So we really kind of entered in, into this with four main goals. Um, one was to increase deputy and consumer safety. We believe that having access to uh, behavioral health expertise does that for, for both, um, both the, the caller and the responder, um, to improve the triage of calls, to try and help make sure that only those people who absolutely needed to go to the hospital would go to the hospital, um, and those that could remain in the community in a less restrictive environment and less restrictive care option um, had that chance, to prevent unnecessary transports to hospitals and to jails. Obviously, we want as few people as possible to go to jail if they didn't commit a, a, you know, a public serious crime that has a public safety impact. Um, and then there's also the workforce multiplier issue, as, as Frank mentioned on those most of the core responder models, and we have those. We have, um, we have teams with both Harris County Sheriff's Office and with um, HPD. And, um, but in those scenarios, it's a one mental health clinician to one officer um, kind of model and ratio. And with this, at this point we're at right now, it is more of a one to 10. We have one clinician supporting about 10 um, tablets or deputies that are doing the work. And so it is a, um, essentially the model is that we deploy behavioral health expertise in a HIPAA compliant platform to, as they're dispatched to 911 calls to provide behavioral health expertise and support to that deputy um, in the field. And so we did start it off in pilots. We wanted to make sure that we did not um, kind of overreach and overstep. As Frank mentioned, it was um, certainly, if not the, it was one of the first efforts at this kind of a model and response approach. And, and no one knew exactly how that was going to work or what it was going to look like. Um, starting with, with 30 calls as the first phase of pilot, the first pilot, um, and then moving into multiple phases where we extended the length, duration. We had early, um, you know, there were everything from coverage issues to how do you do the technical handoff, um, what, what are the best tablets? Um, frankly, we, we, we bought some tablets and then decided those weren't the best ones. And we tried to kind of reshuffle and make sure that we got to offer the deputies um, the equipment that was gonna be most helpful for them um, and most relevant and pertinent to them. And then finally, we, we launched into the most significant part of the pilot, which was a, a year long um, implementation, still small scale, um, relatively small number of clinicians um, a controlled number of, of deputies, um, and I'm sure Sergeant Gomez will talk a little bit about that. Um, but it was, if we were to try and do this on a permanent basis, what would that look like? What would the impact be? What is the learnings? What do we need to know about doing it? Um, and, and I will tell you that um, the evaluation started early in that process, and I'll, I'll let them share the outcomes of that, but they, the early implications were so significant that we did begin a conversation with the county officials about how do we expand this, how do we extend this, um, how do we take what is clearly uh, an emerging best practice and leverage that um, further into our community. And I think in large part, um, it was because those four goals um, in and of themselves, while I certainly have clinical goals for clients and hope that you know, good things happen for the people that are, are receiving services, just those, those frankly more self-focused goals and law enforcement focused goals were clearly being met through that process. We clearly were having success with that um, and driving some significant change with that. I think it's important to realize that um, we are still, I think, in the early stages of this. My vision is that ultimately every law enforcement officer in Harris County will have a tablet um, and we'll have clinicians able to respond to them whenever and wherever that happens. Um, I made that statement publicly in a meeting of, of a lot of public safety folks. Um, and one of the officials within the EMS service said, well, why would it not be EMS as well as law enforcement? And so perhaps I need to expand my vision a little bit and think about my friends that are EMS responders. Um, but I, I think 
being able to provide that expertise and input when necessary. Obviously, there are some circumstances where law enforcement needs are going to take priority and they're going to have to respond in, in a way that um, is a public safety response. And, and I respect that and appreciate that there is room to leverage behavioral health expertise and bring a lens in around care coordination, care connection, uh, making triage decisions about what is the right outcome and the right destination for that person. I think it's absolutely critical. I will also just mention I had the, the good fortune of being one of the members of the Mayor's Task Force on Policing Reform um, and, and one of the six um, behavioral recommendations related to behavioral health and policing um, was an implementation of CORE within HPD. Um, obviously, it's just a recommendation. We don't know where that'll go and that'll be up to, to the um, officials and leaders within the city of Houston to, to make that decision. Um, but I thought it was impressive and important um, that it adopted that mainstream um, acceptance to be able to be included as a part of those recommendations and that that group of, of 45 individuals all wholeheartedly supported it. I was, I was in the conversations where those were being vetted as recommendations and there wasn't a single person who didn't think that was a really great idea and, and would um, help improve policing in our community. Um, and so I, I've also been a part of some of those conversations that have happened um, with other jurisdictions and other communities where the idea, as Frank mentioned, it, it being the future, it is already catching on. People already can appreciate the value of the idea. And so I'm excited about being a participant in it. I'm excited about um, the Harris Center's involvement. I appreciate Frank's leadership. Um, certainly, Dr. Fishkin it was critical to the idea. I can assure you that this would not have happened without Frank's leadership. Um, there are untold numbers of projects um, and best practices that exist in our in our community and in the country because of Frank's leadership. He, he, he doesn't um, acknowledge his role um, in um, the, the role of mental health and mental health supports and services in policing um, to the degree that he should. He is, is very much um, a father of many of these efforts and, and, and work that's being done. And so I want to extend that appreciation and acknowledge Frank because none of us would be here talking about any of this if it weren't for Frank's leadership and, and commitment to this idea. Uh, with that, I will, I will turn my time over to the other participants and appreciate the opportunity to join everyone. Stephen, I think you might be on mute. Yeah, I'm going to um, um, respond to some of the questions in the chat. By the way, everybody, um, the Q&A feature is now working properly. So if you have questions that you would like to ask, rather than asking them in the chat feature, it's best if you ask them in the Q&A feature. But Wayne, we do have a question um, from Pamela Bovland who wants to know if you could describe your relationship or describe the relationship between HPD and uh, police department and the police departments and ISDs, HPD and ISDs. So the relationship with HPD, I will take that separate from the ISDs, is, is broad and deep um, in terms of our relationships. We have multiple programs, um, multi-specialty focused issues. We have the CERT teams. Uh, we have, non we have um, mental health crisis clinicians embedded in the Houston Emergency Center, the 911 call center that the city of Houston operates, where we take calls out of the queue and, and de-escalate those calls and try and avoid um, dispatches, frankly, when, when they're not necessary or critical. We have um, CERT teams where we partner with. We have um, homeless outreach teams. There's a variety of um, program supports and collaborations. We happen to be talking about CORE today, which, by the way, I don't know if we said it, it stands for Clinician and Officer Remote Evaluation. Um, that, that's the focus of this conversation, and they haven't implemented this program here, which is why they're not a part of this conversation. Frankly, it's unusual for me to talk about law enforcement and mental health and not have both the Sheriff's Office and um, HPD present because our, our relationships and partnerships are deep with both of those agencies and, and we appreciate them very much. Um, I, don't, I don't know any other mental health leader in, in the country that enjoys such strong support and collaboration from law enforcement as I do, to be frank with you. So, um, so it, is, it is deep and strong and robust. Chief Bainbridge is the um, leader on the law enforcement side at HPD who oversees all their mental health programs. I mentioned the homeless outreach team. We have a chronic consumer stabilization program for, from um, individuals who have frequent and common interactions with law enforcement um, and 911 um, aimed at trying to reduce that that footprint. Um, lots of activities, the Jail Diversion Center that both HCSO and, and HPD are key integral stakeholders in. Um, with the, the police department ISDs, um, it is less so, um, only because once you get past HCSO and HPD, 
it becomes a very large pool of law enforcement agencies. Um, I would not say that's a lack of willingness. I think it is um, probably a, a need to enhance um, those relationships further and figure out how we develop those. And many of those also cover from a mental health standpoint. So you take a, a, an ISD like KDISD where they creep into multiple counties. The Harris Center is, is the local mental health authority for Harris County. There are 38 sister agencies um, like mine that are responsible for the remaining part of Texas. Um, and so the, the res responsibility and roles of community mental health centers as they cross county jurisdictional boundaries becomes complicated and complex. Um, I certainly, not, and I don't want to imply that we don't have strong relationships with the ISDs and the ISD police departments. Um, we have 87 care locations in Harris County, and I think 44 of them are um, co-locations within school district locations, within um, schools um, and across, I think, 12 um, ISDs. So we certainly have those relationships. Um, I focus much on ACSO today because that's the nature of core and where we're at. So Frank, so uh, um, Wayne and Frank, so it's safe to say from what I'm hearing you say that there is active engagement with, uh, involving uh, police with outside agencies that would help them to do the critical functions that they need to do uh, to partner with other agencies such as the Harris Center, but other agencies as well and other programs as well. You mentioned CERT and other things. So that's actively, that's been actively happening. Is that correct? Yes, and as far as other agencies, as far as on the behavioral health side um, and just the community side, uh, law enforcement in Harris County has for a long time worked with NAMI, uh, Mental Health America, Greater Houston. Um, there are different organizations that we work with. Our homeless outreach team works literally with probably close to 100, I mean, a lot of different agencies, uh, homeless. And on law enforcement, you know, we, we also work with a lot of other law enforcement agencies. Uh, the Harris County Sheriff's Office, for example, we will go out and respond and help other agencies in our area, like our CERT, our co-responder units, they will go out and handle calls for some other agencies. HPD, I believe, does the same. So we do collaborate outside of just what we're talking about today. We, we have a lot of agencies that we work with, both within law enforcement and without. Okay, great. If that answers your question. Yeah. I want to acknowledge that um, G, uh, Janice Mitchell asked that she, the states in the um, chat session that she's worked for H, uh, the, H, the Houston Fire Department for 15 years, and she states that mental health crisis response for EMS is desperately needed. So I don't know if you, you saw that in comment, but I just wanted to mention that to everybody. I would imagine so. Um, and did I, Wayne, I, I, did I hear you say that you're, that that's possibly beginning to happen, that you might be working with them as well? I, I think it would be a stretch to say it's beginning to happen. I think there's a willingness and a vision. I don't think we've got a plan or um, funding supports process. I think there's a willingness on probably on both parts. Um, but at this point, we don't have an active plan in place to to initiate that. All right. And then I want to, I don't know, Ashley, if you, did you respond to Mr. Lopez's question? No, I was going to see if um, if Frank would. Um, this is covered uh, very much in the implementation guide that we put together. And so the question, Frank, is have other major cities developed a similar program such as CORE and would it be possible to expand the program on a statewide level? So I was just going to see if you could talk, speak to that a bit. Yeah, so I'm not aware of all the programs in the nation. I'm, I am aware of probably five or six other programs around the nation that are similar to CORE. Interesting, uh, Director Villano, uh, one of the programs is in Charleston, South Carolina. It's probably one of the first. In their program, EMS do have the tablets. And in Charleston, um, if an officer gets a call involving a person in a mental health crisis with no crim criminal nexus to the situation, the uh, EMS actually handle the call, handle the mental health call. It's a little bit different than most jurisdictions that I'm aware of in the country. So there, the EMS has the tablets and it's a very similar program. Um, that's the only program I'm aware of that EMS has tablets and handles mental health calls. But there are other jurisdictions around the country uh, that have a program similar to ours. Uh, upstate New York started a program fairly recently and there are other localities. There are more We've been contacted from agencies all around the country and outside the United States. We've been contacted from agencies in Canada that are interested in the program. 
Um, as far as being implemented on a statewide level, I think like Wayne said, um, you know, I think, you know, probably in the future, I, I would think literally Don't, every Let me add a little bit to that, Frank. Yeah. So I, I do happen to know, HHFC in the last legislative session, um, there was a, a bill that passed that directed HHSC to do a, a stakeholder and planning activity around access to mental health services in rural communities. And so the state did a really nice job. Um, I think they call it All Access Texas, I think is their moniker for it. But they, did, they looked at the state hospital regions um, and catchment areas and pulled together stakeholders. And there's, I think, seven of them. And I think in at least three of those regions, one of the recommendations that came out of that work was a similar program to, to CORE. Um, you know, now that doesn't mean it'll automatically be implemented, but I think the report that will go to this to the legislature when it comes back in session um, will it will include a report from each of those regions, and I think it would be hard to ignore um, the 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 desire to implement a best practice that's been established already in a part of the state. So I do I'm optimistic that maybe not on a statewide basis, but at least on a regionalized basis, we might begin to see some movement around this in Texas. And and if I'm not mistaken, haven't people already reached out to you? Do you folks to, about replicating the program in their own areas? Yeah, yes, we, we have had, like I said, we've had calls from all across the country and, and even Canada. And as Dr. Blackburn mentioned, uh, Arnold Ventures did ask us to do an implementation guide. It's an electronic uh, PDF PowerPoint, either, either way you want it. And it has a lot of information on it. And it does have the, the other jurisdictions that I'm aware of that have similar programs. It has um, charts that compare the different programs. What platforms do they use? Who's it used for? What kind of tablets do they use? Just a lot of different comparisons. So that's available to anyone who wants it. Great, so if anyone does want that, just email me. My email is in the uh, chat feature and uh, I will send that out to you as well as the link to the recording. All right, so um, I'm gonna turn this over to uh, um, Sergeant Gomez. And uh, Sergeant Gomez, I'm hoping between you and Ms. Lorio, you can explain exactly what the procedure is for the implementation of, of the program. You know, what happens when you're out on duty, you know, the, that whole process. Okay, um, just to go back on uh, something that Mr. Y uh, Mr. Wayne Young said about Frank Webb, uh, in law enforcement, we call him the godfather of CIT uh, because everything that we've done here, especially here at the Sheriff's Office since uh, Sheriff Gonzalez uh, came into office, with Frank Webb was we I mean we implemented a lot of mental health behavioral health related programs because of the leadership of Mr. Webb so that's how we know him in our community the godfather of CIT that's how we introduce him before before we put him in class um well we I spent about seven years in the crisis intervention response team when it was first made back in 2011 uh it's a great program it partners uh, a mental health peace officer with a mental health clinician from the Harris Center and because the county is so massive and something that uh, Mr. Young and Frank Webb were talking about, about how we do help other jurisdictions within Harris County. Sometimes when I was in CERT, we were driving 30 minutes to an hour to a call. And that is a, a patrolman out there with the consumer waiting for us to get there for the assessment. Uh, though it is a very good program, sometimes we, we spend a lot of time on the road. You know, you get there 30, you know, trying to get there 30 minutes and then an assessment there another 30 minutes and then driving back to the hospital another hour and, and just time keeps going. Uh, when we first started with CORE in December of 2017, myself and two other CERT deputies, we kind of knew already what to do on these calls 99% of the time. So we wanted to test out the equipment, if the technology worked, are these assessments kind of like the same assessment we would do in CERT. And we found that it worked. The technology worked, the, the iPads were great. Uh, we figured out whether we wanted the mini iPads or the bigger iPads, what, what could kind of technology would be using out there. Uh, during phase two, uh, well, actually phase three, phase two, I'm sorry, we figured out that uh, the clinicians cannot be in a car driving around while they're, they're answering calls for, uh, you know, via the iPad. They needed to be somewhere stationary. So we, you know, we ended up going to 9401 Southwest Freeway where the clinicians were going to be stationed at because we found that uh, if they were moving around, there were some connectivity issues. They might be already en route to another call, you know, and so they wouldn't be able to answer. Um, during phase three, we had 20 deputies. Uh, these are 20 deputies that were in the regular uh, calls for, uh, loop for calls for service. They answer other calls from robbery in progress to burglaries and CIT calls. So there weren't specifically CIT units. They were, you know, deputies that we would, like Mr. Young said, he wishes that one day all deputies have an iPad. These are those deputies. Um, 
we found that we had a very positive feedback because they didn't have to wait for a cert team. And it left the cert teams to handle the more uh, severe cost for service involving a, a consumer. So it eliminated a lot of the wait time for these deputies and they were able to have a better assessment to where they could resolve the call on scene. And this was huge because a lot of the times, as we all know, hospitals across, especially here in Harris County, uh, are getting inundated with individuals that don't need to be there because we don't know what else to do in law enforcement. Or to, you know, we don't know what else to do with them out in the field. So having that proper assessment out there, uh, it was a better guide for that deputy to do what, you know, to uh, have an assistance on what to do out in the field with that individual. And a lot of the times it connected them to resources. So during phase three, we found that this is a great program uh, to uh, have out there. Now, currently, uh, the thing, you know, I see one of your questions about supervising precision. Uh, as a supervisor, you have to be available to this program 24 seven. I can tell you one time we had an, uh, you know, we trained our deputies. It was an, uh, about two hour class. Uh, during the class, we talk about the history because this was not an overnight program. Like uh, Mr. Young was saying, you know, this is, I think we're still at the beginning stages of a lot of this stuff with the program. So uh, we explain how we got started and how we led up to where we're at. And we go through everything from how to use the iPad to uh, when to use the iPad, the assessments and things like that. But still being a supervisor over the program, you have to be available to the deputies 24 seven. Uh, just for example, I can give you a story. Uh, one night at two in the morning uh, while I'm asleep and my wife is next to me, I get a call from a deputy saying he can't connect to a clinician. Well, he had forgot the password. So he couldn't get into the, uh, into the uh, Live Size app because he had forgotten how to do the password and things like that. So I had to connect into Live Size and just imagine this, I'm in two in the morning and I'm connecting via Live Size and there's a clinician there then, uh, one of the, I believe it's uh, Miss White, she answers and my wife hears that what are you doing in the closet you know kind of deal so as a supervisor you know uh, when you're overseeing a 24 7 program you have to be available because these are 100 deputies spread out through three different shifts and all over the county and there's going to be issues whether it's with technology or a question on what to do or you know how to go about things so it's it's a very it's challenging as a supervisor to be available to your deputies all the time which um and uh Currently, <clears throat> with CORE, we have responded over 400 calls for service. So that's over 400 assessments have been done. Uh, it's eliminated a lot of the repeat callers because at least the feedback that we've gotten from our deputies, a lot of the times where uh, the assessment is done and that individual is left on scene, the Harris Center will do a follow-up within 24 hours. So they were able to connect them to resources. So that's actually eliminated some of our repeat callers because the Harris Center actually engages them out in the field early on in, in the crisis. Go ahead, Ms. Keisha. I can hear you. Sergeant Gomez, there's a question for you um, in the Q&A. Will law enforcement be trained in the core program? How long will law enforcement be trained in the program? And will core be advertised and explained to Houstonians? So since December of 2017, uh, myself, Mr. Webb, uh, at the time it was Dr. Fishkin, we have been in several uh, news, news slots. And I think in the last year or so, we've actually had a lot of media attention, whether it be via Twitter, Facebook, we've uh, broadcasted, a, 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 I think also Instagram now. Uh, we've been on several, uh, and I'd be happy, I have all those if you want, uh, if you want me to send them uh, different news clips. We've been involved with the Harris Center, showing the iPad, uh, how it works. I think recently I did uh, one for Channel 11. Uh, Miss Melissa Correa, she had uh, done one of the first core interviews when we first got started, and she did a follow up a few weeks ago. So uh, as far as training, one of the things that Sheriff Gonzalez did when he came to office is made sure that every employee or detention officer deputy gets the 40 hour CIT class. So once we started with the core program, that is something that we've implemented in our 40 hour CIT class. And also anybody that's part of the core program will go through a two hour uh, class. And then also something else that uh, Sheriff Gonzalez did is implement an eight hour interdepartment CIT update class. And so in that eight hour class, core will also be mentioned. So everybody across the county, if law enforcement wise, will be training how to use the iPad or when to call for an iPad if search's not available. So, so for those of us who, who are, may not be familiar, can you uh, spell out the acronym CIT and CERT? 
So CERT is a crisis intervention response team. CIT, it's either the crisis intervention team or crisis intervention training. Depends on how you, how you do it. Yeah. All right, then we have another question for you there. I don't know if you can see it. So from my understanding from this question, is it something that when you call 911, can you request core? Uh, we found that a, there are calls for service out there that can be handled by the deputy him, him or herself without having to call core. Uh, we do have a flow chart that says if a deputy responds to a call for service with a behavioral health nexus uh, and they believe that they either need some other type of CIT assistance, they have the option to call core or the CERT teams. If uh, we, when I was in CERT, uh, when we first started, when we first start, started uh, over the years, people kind of, there was a pin that we used there and people kind of started knowing what CERT was. So a lot of our notes when we get the call for service will say requested CIT deputy or CIT officer. Uh, and that'll, and that doesn't mean that necessarily you need an iPad or a CERT team. You just need somebody that is CIT trained that's able to understand what's going on with that call. Once that happens, and then the deputy can, you know, uh, call for a core unit or a CERT team. Okay, great. Um, all right, so um, let's turn this over. No, you know, I wanted to go back just a quick uh, second, um, possibly to Wayne or uh, Frank or even you, Sergeant Gomez. Where are we now with commissioner's court funding to expand core? Yeah, so I, I'll just respond, Frank, feel free to add. Um, and, and and I say that because Frank took leadership on a lot of this. Um, Commissioner's Court heard about the project, understood the impact that it was having, um, and actually one of the members of the court approached us and said, hey, we would really like to be able to consider um, funding an expansion of CORE um, based on what we've heard, if, if you would put together a proposal for us to consider um, in the new budget cycle. And so we did that, um, worked in partnership with HCSO, um, requested 80, um, additional tablets to be able to um, expand. The strategy was to link those tablets to the training deputies. Um, two reasons. One, because they're always there. We know that they cover all the shifts in all the areas. Um, and also because as new deputies came on, if they were engaged in that training, then they would kind of by, by um, proxy begin to be trained and understand how they work and, and have understand that the access is available to those. So um, Harris County provided $900,000 in funding for this fiscal year for an expansion of core from the 20 tablet pilot to a full blown implementation that would, would have about 100 tablets out in the, in the field in total. And just real quick, uh, just to add to Mr. Young's uh, about uh, the core model we went with, uh, we gave the iPads to our field training officers. And like he said, you know, they are training the future of policing. So uh, when FTOs get dispatched to a call for service, they have the option, you know, our, our field training officers pretty much are, are trained up to the, to the most recent types of training. So they're able to train our deputies. With that being said, uh, they're exposed to a little bit more also as well because uh, other deputies are going to call on them for that iPad. So they get more, they'll get, uh, the trainees will get also use out of that iPad. And director, if I may, I'd just like to add um, the evaluate, University of Houston, you know, downtown, Dr. Blackburn's team is currently evaluating our program. They conducted a midterm evaluation and that midterm evaluation, I think was instrumental in us getting the funding. So I want to thank, University of Houston, and of course, that was funded by Arnold Venture, so we appreciate both of them for our, I don't think we'd have the program we have today without them. And then we have a question. That, in the, that proposal uh, relied heavily upon their, their evaluation, their, and their interim report, and, and the findings that they had um, initially. And is funding an issue for more widespread use of the core model? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it becomes an issue if you've got to have someone, the tablets are not that expensive at the end of the day. I mean, most of us know kind of what those look like, and we use we use a version or two old tablets, so we get them at a pretty good discount from, from our, um, our, our provider. Um, but you do have to have a clinician to answer the phones. Um, and so clinicians cost. And, and so the, the heaviest burden associated with expansion is investing in those clinicians to be able to extend out, you know, um, additional tablets and additional deputies or, or officers on the other end of that. You begin to get an economy of scale. Um, similar to our crisis line, we have a, a a regular mental health crisis line that we answer about 130,000 calls a year. And when you start getting up to that kind of volume, you can start getting an economy of scale that makes it much easier um, to scale. But there is just an initial investment that has to happen in the, 
and having the clinicians available to make sure. The last thing I want is for a deputy to make a call in and us not have anybody there to be able to answer that line. Um, I think that would be the worst case scenario for us. And so we wanna make sure that we have the coverage available. And, and so it, that's the cost of it really. The, the cell plan and the, the tablet is a relatively small um, initial cost for startup, but the, the real ongoing expenses associated with that clinical expertise. Thank you. All right, let's turn this over to Ms. Keisha Lorio. Uh, Keisha, if you would introduce yourself. Good afternoon, my name is Keisha Lorio. I'm actually the program director for the crisis intervention response team and the clinician officer remote evaluation program. Been working with the law enforcement partnerships for the last 10 years. I actually want to go back for a moment because one thing about working with law enforcement, we actually do, we actually are out in the community a lot. So I do have an officer that goes with me to, for instance, KDISD, Cypress ISD, a lot of the different ISDs to actually present on the trainings for de-escalation skills and the services that the Harris Center provides. So we are out there working with the schools, going to like their, their meetings to let them know about our services. So just want to go back on that a little bit. Now I'm gonna be talking about the clinician's experience with CORE. We have six clinicians, two that work day shift, two that work evening shift, two that work overnight shift. And currently they're actually working remote. They love working remote. It's actually very beneficial because they're more likely to actually just say, okay, instead of taking off, because we don't have that many clinicians, so instead of taking off, I'm just gonna take my iPad and my laptop with me and I can just answer calls wherever I'm at. So working remote, we not have to worry about traffic and they can just wake up, get ready and just take calls has been very beneficial to them. As far as how they stay connected to each other, they actually stay connected via the LifeSize app. For instance, again, like Gomez says, this program is 24 seven. So one thing about supervising a program is 24 seven, you have to be available 24 seven, check in on your staff 24 seven. So seven o'clock in the morning when one person's getting off, the next person getting on, I may connect their life size and now we can have a three-way meeting and it, it just works. And the other person can be available for calls to make sure that we actually are covered 24 seven for the deputies. So there's always somebody available for them. When someone, when one of the staff members comes on for their shift, they email all the deputies say, hey, we're on, this is my name, this is my contact information. So the deputies constantly are seeing these individuals' names, they get to know them, build their rapport with them, so they're more likely to call. So that's one thing that we initiated that's been helpful. They, the clinicians love, they say they love working with the deputies, the, the deputies pretty much call them not only for assessments, but also just for information. For linkage to services to find out if they have hospital beds that's close to them. They call for a lot of different things, not only just for assessments. As far as the clinician's role, however, their role is to, to actually complete assessments. One thing that was surprising when we first started, even the pilot back in July of 2018, they were saying, well, maybe the, the patients may not actually want to be assessed via the iPad. And that was one of our concerns that we actually had to get the patient's consent because these patients are different. With our crisis program, those patients, we go out to a call, they're in crisis, we pretty much have to provide services because they are a danger to self or others, or they deteriorated to the fact that they just can't function. So of course we have to provide services for them. The core, the target market for the core is a little bit different these patients have to consent to treatment and want to be assessed via iPad. So we, at first we were like, well, what if they don't want to actually get permission to be assessed via iPad? And fortunately, we haven't had that problem. They're, especially with COVID going on, they're willing to be assessed via iPad, actually tell their story, ask for services via iPad. The calls can range from 15 minutes up to an hour, depending on what's going on. If it's somebody that wants services, that could be a 15 minute phone call. If it's, we're finding out a lot of um, calls now have to deal with family disturbances. People who are just in the house for a long period of time with their family members and 
this is their words, the person is driving them crazy. So those calls take a lot longer. They can actually last up until an hour after everybody has said their piece. Those calls last a little bit longer. So we have the mental health calls that we're dealing with. Then we're having a family disturbance calls that we're dealing with. And then we're also having the parent-child relationships of the child doesn't want to be engaged with school, the child's mad with the parents. So there's a lot going on on those scenes. And one thing about that's different when the, for the clinicians who are not on scene, they have to rely on the deputy a lot more as far as the patient's appearance. What does the house look like? What does the vibe of the individuals feel like? Does the patient have food? Does they have patient have water? Can you show me around? Can I talk to everybody that's in the house to get their statement? So it's a little bit different. For instance, we had this, um, normally if a clinician go out in the field and a fan member may say, hey, this person said that they're suicidal and the clinician may say, okay, well, what's the evidence for this? The, the fan member can show maybe text messages. It's a little bit different if you're not there. So you have to rely on a deputy. Deputy, can you get their phone? Can you ask them to actually show you the text messages? Can you read me the text messages? Can you show me the text messages? Because one thing that's very beneficial is when it is decided that a patient needs to actually be transported to a hospital, the clinician is there to actually connect to that hospital for that deputy. So if a patient needs to go into the hospital, we have the neuropsychiatric center, that's the crisis emergency service, which is next to Ben Top. That's where most, that's where Pretty much 50% of our patients go, the other 50% are resolved on scene. I'll talk about that later. But the good part is, is they actually can call the neuropsychiatric center, say, hey, I have this deputy in the field, they have this patient, they're actually en route, this is going on. And because the county is so massive, by the time they actually get to the neuropsychiatric center or Harris Health, if they have medical problems, the clinician can actually have all the information that the doctor would need already in the system before the deputy actually arrives to the hospital. So they open it up, they know what's going on, so the process is just faster, plus they're expecting the deputy there. So of course, calling the individual hospitals, even finding the deputy a bed if they need to, providing deputy services. We actually had this one deputy that actually had a very difficult patient called the clinician and says, hey, this person doesn't believe I'm here to help. Can you just talk to the patient, talk to the patient, just say, you know, I'm a nice person and I'm here to help them and I'm not trying to bring them to the hospital. I'm actually trying to get them mental health services. So the clinician was there to say, hey, this is about services. This is who I am. We're trying to connect you to resources. And it actually helps the deputy out who needed that help to just calm this patient down and say, you know, I'm not here to bring you to jail. I'm actually here to offer you services. So they do a lot of that kind of mediation. If the patient remains on scene, another important thing is we don't just say, okay, nothing wrong with the patient. We're going to leave them on scene and not follow up with them. Every patient that we leave on scene, we also have the Harris Center crisis line, follow up with that patient. If the patient needs linkage to services, the crisis line can actually refer to our mobile crisis outreach team. So the patient can be seen for another 30 days if need be. They can see a doctor, they can see a nurse, see a, a therapist for a longer time. So it's not like we just see the patient and say, okay, everything's fine. Leave the scene, never see you again, and we're going. We all either hospitalization if they need that or linkage the service and connecting with those individuals. Also, if a patient is open with one of the clinics, another important thing is we actually let the clinics know that law enforcement has come in contact with their patient. I think that's very important for continuum of care and I think that's actually one of the most important things because if, if one of my patients actually was connected with law enforcement or, or had an issue that I didn't know about, because a lot of our calls happen in the evening, happen overnight, the clinics are closed, they may not have access to their caseworker, but we can let them know, hey, this patient actually came in contact with law enforcement, could you please follow up in the morning? And they do that, and they're very gracious about that. 
So very important for continual care. But basically, I mean, the clinicians, they love the program. They actually do want to expand because they actually think this is a, the new way of actually providing services. They keep saying, you know, how many, you know, I want this to go nationwide. Like, okay, look, slow down for a little bit. We're trying to get this, you know, going. But they, they, they love it, which is a great thing. They, because at first we had this one clinician that said, well, I'm really hands on, but I want to try something new to build my skills. And so that, that actually clinician actually loves doing the remote evaluations and getting to know the deputies, providing services, you know, on a continual basis. So as far as the clinician's experience, not one of them has said that they had any challenges that they didn't feel that it wasn't working and they really enjoyed their job. So I, I have a question. So maybe you and Frank together can answer this. Take us through a, a, a typical scenario. The officer gets a call saying there's a disturbance. He goes to the scene and he, before he goes to the scene, he's briefed on what the, what the disturbance is and then he decides, well, I, I need to call a clinician. And he calls a clinician and he gets, tells him the information he has. Then he goes to the scene and the clinician is there on the iPad, helping him to walk through any issues that he encounters. Is that how it happens? Go ahead, Jose. So uh, a call will come down, you know, somebody calls the police and, and it goes through our dispatch system. The deputy will get it on their laptop and the computer will read the notes. Um, sometimes it'll say, you know, there is some type of behavioral health uh, component to it or, or sometimes it doesn't. So we cannot, you know, if, a lot of the time there isn't that information. So when we get there, we are having to investigate the scene when we separate all parties involved and figure out that there is a behavioral health nexus and we believe that we need the assistance of the ipad or a cert team we then have the option to call either core cert and talking about core we would call uh the clinician via the ipad on the live size and i saw a question on there talking about if the live size platform works uh we like it as far as law enforcement i know mr young had answered it but uh about uh the harris center but as far as law enforcement with live size it's worked really good for us on our, on our end um, the, the deputy will then talk to the clinician and explain to the clinician everything that's going on on the scene. Then the clinician will ask the deputy to talk to uh, the consumer. If it's safe to do so, we'll give the iPad to the clinician. It has an OtterBox, I actually pulled out an iPad. It has an OtterBox, so um, it doesn't survive, by, by the way, if it gets run over, but it'll survive being thrown. Um, we figured that out during phase three. So. Uh, we'll give the iPad to the consumer and the consumer talks to the clinician and we'll stand by just to hear kind of the conversation, make sure, you know, no things are, you know, it's not getting out of line or anything like that as far as getting violent or something or too aggressive. So we'll stand there and or sit there with them uh, and give them the iPad and they'll do the assessment. Then the, the consumer will give the iPad back to the deputy. Uh, a secondary deputy will wait with the consumer, make sure it's still safe. Uh, the clinician and the deputy will talk about what the best outcome is for that, that consumer, whether it's to leave them on scene or take them to jail if it's, that person is indeed in crisis. I yeah, just want to add, just, just real quickly, if I may, um, I think one of the important things is the deputy can connect with the clinician probably within minutes, two minutes, sometimes almost instantaneously. So it's very, very quick. And that's one of the huge benefits and what the deputies really like, as opposed to having to wait for maybe 30, 45 minutes for a unit to drive there. It's almost instantaneous access to the same level clinician as on the CERT team. The CERT team is our co-responder uh, program. So yeah, if, if the deputy believes that he needs an assessment right there and then, I mean, he just, I mean, it's less than that. It's like 30 seconds. All you got to do is uh, put in the password. As a matter of fact, these iPads have, and we tell our deputies that they can program their fingerprints, so it's a lot faster to open it, and they're able to connect to life size instantly. So is it safe to say then, as a result of this, people who might otherwise be brought to a jail are instead brought to a hospital? Yes. So, I, I, and I think uh, Dr. Blackburn might talk uh, about the midterm evaluation, but we found over 60% of those calls for service involved during the midterm evaluation showed that the, uh, because of the use of the iPad, the assessment being out in the field, we were able to clear those calls on scene. So well, that's that's a, huge. All right. That is huge. That, that's a, a perfect seg then. But before we do that, we want, I want to respond to a question 
from Ms. Mitchell. She asks, is 40 hours of training enough to train officers reframing their perception of behaviors historically deemed as criminal and recognizing a mental health crisis is involved? Um, it is 40 hours. It, we would like to be able to give more, but you know, 40 hours, when you're dedicating 40 hours of training, like let's say to police officers in the academy, whatever, I mean, that's still a lot of time that we're allocating. Um, that's kind of the standard out there. Uh, actually, it's, you know, it's the gold standard. I mean, that's what you want. Many agencies don't get 40, but 40, I think, is adequate. Would we like more? Yes, but we have to be realistic with time and resources and all. And I do think 40 hours is adequate. All right. And her last question I have here is when we refer to crisis, what is classified as a mental health crisis in the field for officers? So we have the health, uh, Texas Health and Safety Code 573.001 that we go by on what uh, we believe somebody is a danger to themselves or others are decompensating uh, to the point where they can't care for themselves. So we, at that point, have we don't have enough time to obtain a mental health warrant. And so therefore we have to take them now because it's emergent. So we have uh, 573 kind of guides us as law enforcement on what, what dictates who we take. Uh, just a little bit to go back on the 40 hour, uh, one of the things that Sheriff Gonzalez did here when he came to office and implement that everybody that gets hired on deputy or detention officer will get this 40 hour class um, that Mr. Webb uh, helped create. Uh, along with that, uh, starting this, uh, this year into next year from here on out, uh, everybody will get an eight hour CIT interdepartment uh, mandated training, eight hours. So though they already had the 40 hour, every year is gonna be an eight hour uh, CIT update on what's going on, refresh on certain uh, topics, uh, kind of keep everybody up to date on what other mental health initiatives we were taking at the Harris County Sheriff's Office, like CORE, Project Guardian that we just ca uh, came out with, uh, so yeah. Great, thank you. And uh, a shameless plug here, uh, Sheriff Gonzalez is a proud graduate of the UHD criminal justice program, so. Um, <laughs> All right, so we, we uh, as I was asking Sergeant Gomez to tell me about, you know, how many, is, is this diverting people from uh, jails to hospitals? He uh, re referred to Dr. Blackburn and the evaluation team to answer that question. So Dr. Blackburn, please take it from there. Okay, thank you. And thanks everybody for being with us this afternoon. Uh, my name is Ashley Blackburn, and I'm a professor of criminal justice and also the chair for the Department of Criminal Justice and Social Work uh, in the College of Public Service at UHD. And um, myself, and I'm going to introduce the other members of our multidisciplinary uh, um, evaluation team that are here with us today. Uh, first, Dr. Lori Brisman Levins. Uh, who uh, was with us when we started this program at UHD as an assistant professor of criminal justice and is now in Ohio at Bowling Green State University. She's joining us from Ohio. Uh, we have Dr. Heather Goltz, um, associate professor of social work, and we have Dr. Uh, Dana Smith, who is an assistant professor of social work. So we're each going to take a small piece uh, and talk about the evaluation. Uh, and I just wanted to begin by describing the project overall. Uh, and especially uh, expressing our, our gratitude um, for the partnerships that we've uh, had and, and are continuing with, um, with the Sheriff's Office, with the Harris Center and with Arnold Ventures um, in, this, in this evaluation and in this work. So we used a mixed methods approach um, and the primary purpose of the process evaluation was to both document and evaluate the implementation of CORE, um, or the telehealth program, uh, before it was renamed, and then to manualize the process for dissemination, which uh, we've talked about doing through the implementation guide. So our process evaluation framework assessed key elements of CORE in terms of how um, the program and, uh, and the technology within the program are implemented, the fidelity of the implementation, the acceptability of the program among stakeholders and <clears throat> the effectiveness of the program as measured by proximal outcomes. And so with that said, I'm gonna hand it off to Lori, who's going to tell you a bit more about the quantitative uh, um, part of the evaluation. 
Okay, thank you. Um, and thanks to everyone who is joining us to hear more about the program. I'm going to talk really briefly um, just about the uh, quantitative portion, as Dr. Blackburn noted. We did include both qualitative and quantitative methods in, in really gathering information about the effectiveness of this program. Um, and, and those really included interviews with, uh, with deputies, with mental health professionals. Uh, we had focus groups. We um, also conducted interviews with um, some of the key stakeholders um, and we did field observations. So that's where officers uh, and um, researchers partnered and researchers were able to do ride alongs with the officers so we could actually conduct um, observation in the field and collect data firsthand on what those experiences with, um, with the core program looked like. Um, and it was Sergeant Gomez and Deputy Heron um, who really oversee from the field this project um, that, that really helped facilitate that process. Um, the other big piece and where we ascertained a lot of the quantitative information from the study was by asking deputies after they completed a core call to complete a questionnaire. So we were able to collect data from each of the actual interactions to say really what was the nature of that call. Um, so there were three main pieces of information collected by the deputies at the completion of the core calls. We collected descriptive data. So that really told us where were the calls occurring, at what time of day were the calls occurring, what kind of consumers and, and what sorts of um, you know, 911 emergencies were they. So deputies uh, completed information about that. We also looked at resolution of the call. So what happened at the conclusion of the call? Was the consumer held in the community? Were they able to leave the scene and leave them there? Were they transported to you know, a hospital setting? Were they transported to jail? So we collected information on resolution. And then we also collected information on deputy perception. So we asked the deputies questions about kind of usefulness of the telehealth in managing those kind of mental health calls in the community. And this was the information we used to, um, to look at, at more of the, the, the quantitative findings. And I will note too that UHD partnered as well with an organization called Datitude, and they helped to collect the information and keep that information confidential, um, and also help with some of the analyses. And a lot of that was conducted in partnership with the Harris County Sheriff's Office, Deputy uh, Gomez really headed that up as well as is, or sorry, Sergeant Gomez as well as Deputy Heron in, um, in really gathering that information and ensuring that what we collected from the, the Harris County Sheriff's Office was, you know, accurate and, you know, the information that we needed to, to answer these questions. Um, and I'll just note uh, a couple of, of findings from our midterm evaluation. We are in the final throes of completing a final report for the study, which is due next month. So we're really close to having all of that data um, analyzed and, and you know, compiled for a final report. But uh, because that's not quite you know, out yet, we're going to talk more about, or I'm going to just note a couple of findings from that midterm evaluation. And these findings really coincide with what, uh, what Sergeant Gomez was talking about in terms of officer perception. Um, a couple of the things we found is that in having the deputies complete that that form in 80 plus percent of the cases where core was used, the deputies reported that um, the clinicians helped to de-escalate the situation so that they were really important in, in helping manage those crisis situations on scene. They also were, and, and Keisha talked about this as well, able to connect to the consumers to resources in the community so that they felt that those, you know, access to a clinician via the iPad really helped not only to deescalate on scene, but then to help with resources so that maybe that wasn't another call that they were going to the week later, right? Um, also that they um, were able to help make the decision about how to manage that call. So every officer has to decide, is it safe to leave this person on scene or do I need to transport them somewhere? And so the, you know, the connection with the clinician, they were help, helpful in making those decisions. And then finally, and uh, Sergeant Gomez talked about this as well, as well as uh, Frank, they were able to um, decrease the amount of time that officers spent on scene, which again, opened up, it's Houston, they have literally hundreds and hundreds of calls a night. So it opened them up to being able to respond to other types of calls without again, waiting on scene for that mental health professional to arrive. So those were some of the findings. And again, and this was in a very high percentage of those cases. Um, so, you know, we'll talk more about other findings with the final report, but um, I will hand it over to, um, to Dr. Goltz, who's gonna talk more about the qualitative uh, piece. 
Thank you. Uh, and so I won't go into a great deal of detail about more finalized qualitative uh, findings, but I want to back up a little bit and piggyback on what Dr. Bruce Nunes Lovin said a, a little bit earlier. What we did was we really wanted to engage as many different types and levels of stakeholders as possible. So uh, Lori and I at one point uh, did at least two focus groups with the call takers and dispatchers and really probed them uh, using a focus group interview guide uh, about their knowledge of the program, uh, their perceptions of the program, the processes that uh, that that brought them in, you know, very much upstream, and what they were hearing or seeing uh, downstream in terms of uh, when they take the calls and then they bring in the deputies and then what they may hear later downstream about what happens. Uh, we talked um, in terms of uh, focus groups and interviews with uh, deputies, with clinicians, interviews with uh, uh, administrators, even uh, the sheriff him, himself. Uh, and so uh, from, you know, the very first encounter that a stakeholder might have with CORE all the way up to the 50,000 foot view, we did uh, focus groups and interviews that lasted anywhere from about 30 minutes to an hour plus over uh, a period of several months. Lighthouse of Houston, which used to be known as Lighthouse for the Blind, uh, provided verbatim transcripts in a, in a confidential fashion uh, so that we could use Atlas uh, TI uh, version 8 uh, to look at the verbatim transcripts from those focus groups and interviews. And we did an iterative process, uh, Lori and myself, uh, coding each uh, focus group transcript or interview transcript reading, rereading, doing something called open coding, where we would highlight what we call a chunk, um, you know, a, a sentence or a paragraph that had one and one only idea. And then we'll co we've collapsed those together into what we call themes. Those themes give us information about the fidelity uh, of the implementation, the process itself, the accessibility, the acceptability of the program, and so on. All of those uh, kinds of uh, potential outcomes uh, that Dr. Blackburn mentioned earlier. So I'll stop here, and I will uh, turn over the presentation to uh, Dr. Dana Smith. Maybe Dr. Smith had to step away for a minute. So why was don't we- trying to unmute and having trouble there. It would not unmute for me for some reason. I clicked it about five or six times. Sorry, Sorry about that. Um, glad to be here and just really, really appreciate the time that we've had to work with students. And that's what I want to talk with you about very briefly. We're very thankful that the Arnold Foundation allowed us to bring students into the fold and have students to learn along with us during this process and to have them to contribute to the reporting and to the process that we, um, that we took, that we undertook. Um, some of the examples of what students were able to do is that they helped with the literature review. Um, they helped define um, acronyms, which were very important because we had transcripts, lots of pages and pages of transcripts and lots and lots of alphabet soup, I'll call it. And so there are acronyms that needed to be defined so that as um, we were, as the data were being analyzed, everything was really clear. This gave the students an opportunity to do a little investigative work, figure out what the acronyms meant, put that together um, for the team, but also it helped with their own personal learning as they learned some new information and, and what those acronyms meant. Another thing that they were able to do is help with information for cost analysis by um, looking for information about um, what the cost of certain services were in our county and in our region. They did a number of things. Those are just a few highlights. Um, and in the interest of time, I just wanted to, to say again, thank you to the um, Arnold Ventures for allowing us to incorporate students. We're in the field of education. It's always important for us to bring students along and make sure that they can be an integral part of any process that we are undertaking. And I'll pass it back to Dr. Blackburn. Okay, so thank you all. And I know that was really quick. And if there's any q and I will um, answer those. I just want to close our 
piece um, by saying um, thanks to, to Lori for sharing the midterm evaluation findings or some of them, uh, they were very positive and I do feel like, as has been mentioned, uh, were, uh, were helpful in, in the commissioner court, commissioner's court um, decision to uh, further fund uh, this program. And um, I uh, also wanna say that we've been able to share those findings at both statewide and international conferences, uh, as well as in local and national outlets, uh, such as the police chief and others. Um, and because uh, it's taken a little longer, we did receive an extension due to COVID, but we do look forward to submitting our final report um, in the coming weeks in October to Arnold Ventures. Um, and, uh, and we appreciate uh, everybody for the teamwork uh, in getting this, this evaluation completed. So I will pass it on to, um, to Stephen uh, or on to Thank Eric. you. Thank you, Dr. Blackburn, Dr. Goltz, Dr. Lovins, and Dr. Smith. I just want to point out that um, what Dr. Smith does is also one of our other hats is the Director of Field Instruction for the Social Work Program. She is so integral in connecting students to real life um, real life situations that improve upon their education, uh, it, it can't be overstated because, you know, uh, learning just doesn't happen in the classroom. It happens in the field as you're doing the work that you're doing. And Dr. Smith is integral in that. So thank you, Dr. Smith. Thank you, all, all of you. Um, so let's turn it over to uh, Katie Bialik, and she is with Arnold Ventures. And Arnold Ventures is the philanthropic organization uh, with headquarters here in Houston, Washington, and New York that funded this program. Katie? Hi, thank you. Uh, thanks so much for, for allowing me to participate in today's panel. And thank you for the partners at the Harris County Sheriff's Office and the Harris Center and University of Houston. Um, it's been, I think, such an interesting project to work on with, with all of you. Uh, so as Stephen mentioned, my name is Katie Bialik. I am a criminal justice manager at Arnold Ventures. Arnold Ventures is a philanthropic organization that's been around for a little over 10 years now, and we are based in Houston, um, but we work on a number of issues. So criminal justice, healthcare, public finance, uh, and really kind of the overarching theme across all of our work is trying to maximize opportunity and minimize injustice. And I think our work within the criminal justice portfolio um, really kind of exemplifies that. So I specifically work on our policing team and most of the projects that I'm working on really sit at the intersection of law enforcement, behavioral health and homelessness. Um, so we know there's a lot of people who come into contact with law enforcement, cycle into the criminal justice system due to these underlying issues. And for far too long, we've relied on law enforcement to solve all of these problems. And I think it's partnerships like this between the Harris Center and Harris County Sheriff's Office and HPD and others that really present an opportunity for what, you know, what public safety should look like and how we should be responding to these issues and that we can't just continue to take these siloed approaches that rely on law enforcement alone or mental health providers alone because this work is, is messy and, and we know that. Um, so I would say CORE, you know, just is a perfect example in the way in which communities are not only developing these really strong partnerships, but they're also piloting and testing um, new ideas. And I think the way that CORE was developed and evolved and has scaled up over the past few years is a perfect example of that. So, you know, I think lots of folks on today's call have acknowledged Frank Webb as, you know, a leader in this field, and we would not be sitting here today if it weren't for him either. So we are so appreciative of him and all of the work that he's been doing to really lead up these efforts. Um, and I think, you know, for CORE, it's been so exciting because it's, it's an opportunity to think about not just how these strong partnerships can support better response to individuals in crisis, but what is the role of technology and really being able to scale these efforts across a community like Harris County, which is massive in size and I think has 
you know, experiences a lot of challenges um, that aren't necessarily unique from other places across the country, but I think just the vast size of the county itself and the population and, and the number of people that, that all of the partners on today's call are trying to support. Um, I think really demonstrate if this can happen in, in a place like Harris County, I think it can happen in other places across the country. So, you know, I think our, our interest, like I said, was really because of the partnerships, because of the role of technology, and because of the opportunity to rethink how we're responding to individuals in crisis. And it was also just an acknowledgement of the problem that mental health resources across the country and the state of Texas are decreasing at the same time that calls for help are increasing. And we know that jails and prisons for far too long have served as kind of the asylum for individuals who can't be served by the community. And so for all of those reasons, you know, we saw this as, you know, a really promising potential solution to, to explore. Um, you know, I think the program itself, I won't, I, you know, I think it's already been explained by Sergeant Gomez um, really well, but I think it, you know, it's, it's ability to promote better triage of calls and, and keep individuals out of not just jails, but hospital emergency departments too. We know that if we can resolve a call in the community and the Harris Center can follow up later, that a lot of times is a better outcome for the individual, not just from an individual outcome perspective, but also when we think about cost and time it takes for transporting and, and the cost to, to serve someone in um, these more restrictive settings. I think it also helps to keep deputies and, and consumers safe, which the, the evaluation I think speaks to some of this. Um, and I think what is kind of most interesting about this program in particular, um, as it compares to a lot of other programs across the country that are trying to improve law enforcement response to individuals in mental health crisis, is kind of this force multiplier effect that I think so many folks on the call today have spoken to. So while, you know, I think that there is a lot of promise in co-responder programs and thinking about better training for first responders and thinking about opportunities to divert calls in the, you know, at the point of 911, at the end of the day, we know that law enforcement are going to be dispatched to a lot of these calls for service and we can't hire a clinician to go out with every officer to every call. And so the opportunity to leverage technology um, in a partnership like that that exists with the Harris Center to bring clinicians to the scene um, and, and to really help to understand the situation and think about the best way to support the individual and and really help to address their needs and their family needs, I think is, is um, I, I think it's just really promising and something that, that could potentially be scaled more broadly. Um, so when it comes to the evaluation itself, you know, I think this is kind of the last thing that I'll say, but beyond the program being promising, I think there's a lot of good ideas that are presented that in theory or even in implementation um, seem to be working. But I think what's also really unique about all of the partners on today's call is their commitment to dip, diving into the data to really understand what's working and what's not. So without looking at some of these outcome data and without talking to the stakeholders, both from the, the mental health side, from the law enforcement side, but even the the individuals who are clients of these services without understanding whether or not they think that this is working and opportunities for improvement, I think it's a huge kind of missed opportunity. And we've seen a ton of innovation across the country in terms of these new response models, but the evidence around these programs is just really, really limited. And when it comes to trying to make sound policy and decisions and trying to think about what the best investment looks like for any given community, depending on their partnerships and their, um, you know, not just partnerships, but like funding and, and all, all of the things that really matter. Like, you know, there's not going to be a one size fits solution. And so having evidence that you can turn to to see how a program is implemented and does it seem to be working, I think is, is incredibly important, especially when does it working is answered beyond just kind of the anecdotal, like, yes, this seems like a good thing for our community. Um, so with all of that, I think for, for us as, as a funder and for me personally, you know, I'm just deeply committed to these issues and Arnold is too. And I think 
that from a national perspective, there is just so much opportunity. And I think, you know, Frank, but others on the call as well have really been leveraging that and trying to share the story of CORE, but also learn and share what's happening uh, in other communities. And so I'm going to drop a link into the, the chat for folks to see um, just of a review that we recently funded with an organization called APT Associates that kind of looks at all of the different program models that exist for at the point of law enforcement, at the point of 911, some of these more kind of proactive outreach programs like homeless outreach teams um, to just kind of say like, there are lots of options out there. There is not one solution that's going to solve these problems for every community. And like Harris County is a perfect example. You know, they've got training, they've got co-responder teams. You guys have, you know, this, this core option. Like you're thinking about these issues in a really comprehensive way. And I think this guy just provides, you know, a really nice overview for policymakers, for interested community members, anyone that's interested in trying to understand like what is the broader scope of all of these things that are happening and CORE is highlighted within this um, within this report because I think it is such a good example but there are lots of ways to approach this issue and so um, just really you know pleased to be able to to support this project in particular and to continue to elevate these types of conversations because I think that they are are you know so important and so timely right now um, you know if we if we want to rethink public safety we need good options for doing that and I think you need really strong partners and in, in Harris County Houston they're they're lucky to have you know everyone that's on today's call Thank you, Katie. Um, does anyone have any other questions that they would like to ask in the Q&A? Well, we got a compliments to all, especially Frank Webb for his continued work to make this world a better place for officers and those with mental injuries. Kudos to Frank, absolutely. And Katie just uh, put the link that she was talking about online. I am gonna type in my email address again and if you are interested, I can uh, compile all these links and send them out to you as well. So with no further questions, the panelists, thank you very, very much for not only attending today, but for all the work that you do to make this type of program and other programs possible. And uh, audience, thank you very much for attending the, uh, today. Any questions, please do not hesitate at all to uh, email me or even to call me at the office. I'll put my number in there too in case you need to get in touch with me. All right, thank you everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, bye, thanks for your time. Thank you.